I'm Trevor Phillips. This is Common Ground, where each week we look for agreement on a hot-button issue dividing the nation. Tonight, a matter of life and death. I wanted to put a pillow over her face to try and end her suffering. But then it occurred to me that no father should have to be put through a situation like this. All the time that I've opposed it, I felt a bit of a hypocrite because I've thought that if ever, heaven forbid, I was, for example, to contract motor neuron disease, I would want it for me. Had the law permitted his life to be ended ahead of time, there is no doubt in my mind that one or more of us would have sold out for death. Neither I nor colleagues have the objectivity to make judgments because our compassion prevents it. Many people have said to me, if my life was like yours, I would kill myself. My lords, I have a huge amount of privilege in my life. But if people think this, it becomes very easy for them to conflate disability and a six month diagnosis and decide that we have no right to live. Last week, a petition calling on Parliament to debate the legalisation of assisted dying broke through the 100,000 signature mark that compels MPs to consider the so-called right to die once again. Advocates say that no care pathway, however sophisticated, will completely mitigate the pain and fear of terminal illness and that no one should be denied the choice to die in a planned and dignified fashion. Opponents argue that no law can guarantee a good death, but that opening the door to legal assisted dying devalues the lives of many who can live a good life and place intolerable moral pressure on health professionals. Our choice, if we need to be helped to die, should those who assist us be treated as dispensing mercy or as criminals? In the next 30 minutes, two passionate believers come head to head in the search for common ground. With me tonight, the Conservative peer and former Cabinet Minister, Lord Michael Forsyth, and the crossbench peer and Paralympian, Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson. Michael, what is the precise legal change that you are seeking and why does it matter to you? Well, I would like people to be able to um, be assisted to die where they are facing a terminal illness and where perhaps they're in great pain. Um, and I think they should have that choice. Why it matters to me is because I would want it for myself, but the law doesn't provide for it. It is available to some people who can go to Switzerland if you've got £10,000, but they have to go without any family members because of the risk of criminal uh, conviction. And it seems to me uh, that uh, if you want something for yourself but you're prepared to deny it from other people, you need to have a hard think. And when my father was dying, I went to see him and he had a, a day or two to, to live and uh, he was in great pain. And I said to him, look, I'm really sorry that you're in such pain. And he said, well, you're to blame, Michael. And I was completely taken back by this. And he said, I said, well, how do you mean I'm to blame? And he said, well, you have consistently voted against the right uh, to die. And I, I wanted that and I can't have that. And um, that changed my whole approach. But of course, the reasons that I voted against before are still valid, which is you need to have protections in place, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, Tani, uh, why do you oppose this so strongly? So I think the legislation, as it currently exists, uh, allows the Crown Prosecution Service and the police to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and the reason I oppose it is because, actually, when you look at the legislation, you know, it's six months prognosis, it's two doctors, a uh, settled wish. That sounds good. Um, and if you'd asked me 25 years ago, I'd have been, you know, arguing for a change. But for me, when I started looking at this, and I knew when I came to the Lords that this is one of the things that would be debated, you start looking at the how, the why, uh, the when, who, the drugs that will be used. 
And, you know, unfortunately on our side, there are no quick sound bites to counteract the argument of changing the law. But uh, the detail of what can happen um, really concerns me. And then also as a disabled person, um, you know, uh, you look at the do not attempt resuscitation orders that were put on disabled people at the start of the pandemic with no consultation and the coronavirus legislation, I, I really worry how disabled people would be treated if this became law. OK. Well, uh, we start with actually one piece of common ground, which is that both of you seem prepared to change your mind when confronted with a particular piece of reality. So let's see where that gets us. And let's look, start by looking more closely at your case, Michael. Before we do, I, I want to hear from Dr Amy Prophet. She's the president of the Association for Palliative Medicine, and she opposes a change in the law. And she's talking here about her experience with a patient with cancer affecting her bones. I saw her the very day that the House of Lords was debating assisted dying recently, and she begged me to end her life because of her fear from the stories in the press of dying people with uncontrolled pain and suffering. She couldn't bear the thought that this would be her future too. I said the law prevented me from doing that. Within a week of specialist care, expert symptom control and interventions, she had stopped talking about death and was planning instead to attend a really important family celebration. Had the law been different, that time and effort would have been spent assessing her eligibility, arranging for her to end her life. Uh, Michael, how do you uh, deal with that? Because essentially... Your case is about choice, but uh, in a sense, what Amy Prophet is saying is that in that case, the, the choice might have been um, a false one for the patient. Well, of course, it's a very reasonable argument to put, but and we don't we, we don't need a crystal wall. We can actually see the future. By I mean, there are two hundred million people in this world who live in countries where there is um, assisted dying, and we can see whether or not that results in um, disabled people, as Tani suggests, feeling um, uh, pressure, and there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, and uh, if someone is going to make a choice of that kind, then they are going to have to um, be assessed and they're going to have to talk to doctors. And um, in the end, are we really going to deny individuals uh, the choice because um, some people may make the wrong decision. They can make the wrong decision now by going to Switzerland and there are no safeguards whatsoever. So we, we need to have some kind of regulated framework and we can see how that operates in other countries. And where Tani and I, I think, could agree is it's ridiculous that the House of Commons has not been able to debate this properly and consider proper legislation because what happens with private members' legislation is the opponents table lots of amendments and it runs out of time. We, we, may, we may get to this point where I think we probably will agree it's good to talk about this, but, Tani, what do you, what do you, how do you respond to Michael's main point that actually uh, that uh, people should be given this kind of choice? And... Choice is quite an, an arbitrary word because some people have more choice than others, uh, and it's a very privileged position to be in. So, you know, we look at some of the jurisdictions around the world uh, and in America uh, where... You know, people um, are being encouraged to, to make this so-called choice. So in Oregon, if you don't have great medical insurance, you're offered assisted dying instead of uh, cancer treatment. Uh, if you look at uh, Canada, where the MAID legislation has expanded really rapidly, there are a number of disabled people who've said, you know, very openly that they feel that they're being or will be pushed down this road. So, you know, every jurisdiction in but the, the world... the expansion... Sorry, Tani, to interrupt you, but the expansion in Canada has resulted uh, because of judicial activism in the courts, which you were arguing was a better way of, of dealing with these matters earlier on. In what way, sorry? In the, the but, extension... But Canada, of... Canada's expanded quite yes, rapidly, but, but... sort of eight times the number of people in Canada. And, and you can argue once the, the law comes in, people know about it and become aware of it, then more people will opt for it. But, if, but not know. because of legislative changes, because of actions in the courts. No, but, Do... but it's expanded, however it's expanded. Oh, but you're arguing we should rely 
on the judgment of the courts. And, and I'm, no, saying... I'm, not, I'm not arguing that at all. I'm just talking about expansion and actually how disabled people no, but feel on. treated. But, but let's just stick with the... I mean, whatever, whatever the reason, whether it's judicial activism or so your point is that the experience is that more people have been drawn into, as it were, the net mm. of... Uh, b making the choice to, yeah. to end their lives. So in Vermont, you now no longer have to see a doctor. The doctors don't have to know you. So in terms of expansion, they can now do it by Skype but... or online. Anorexia, yeah. uh, mental health. So, you know, one of the reasons, you know, Right to Die organisation in the UK is already saying, you know, if the law passes, there shouldn't be that six-month prognosis. So it's not just the law as it currently stands, which you could argue this is the p potential legislation but, we're looking at. But, but the fear sorry, of expansion so, is so Michael, worry. The, 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 the point so, here is you can pass a law, but you don't know how it's going to operate in practice, and well, we, it may start to encompass people that you didn't well, anticipate. We, uh, it's interesting that Tani has focused on uh, the expansion of the remit. That is the reason why we need to have legislation which defines very clearly to whom it applies and the circumstances in which they can make that choice. At the moment, we have no protections whatsoever. I mean, uh, one of the things that people worry about is pressure, perhaps, from unscrupulous relatives to mm. encourage people. Um, at the moment, people can go off to Switzerland and there is no protection whatsoever. And that is why it is much better for us to have Parliament debate this matter, something which the Scottish um, uh, Parliament are way ahead of Westminster on. So we could end up with a situation where we have one law in one part of the United Kingdom and a completely unacceptable situation in the rest of the United Kingdom. But if the law changes, could you see the potential for, say, another Harold Shipman being covered up? Because... I, I, I want to pursue but... some of those, and I want to talk about the, what the neighbours are doing. Um, we talked a little bit about your... Uh, Position, Michael. Let's 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 look at uh, yours now, uh, Tani. Um, but before we do that, let's hear from David Mins. He has a form of incurable cancer, cancer called acute myeloma. He also watched his daughter die from cancer, and he supports a change in the law. I'm not saying that I would actually end my own life, even with a sister dying. It's just that that option should be available to me. Should my pain and my suffering get to the point where it becomes intolerable. A change in the law is a compassionate change. It's something that, that, that the terminally ill need. It's not going to happen for me, but I would like to think that it's going to happen for other people. And I want to highlight my case to make MPs aware that there is a lot of suffering going on with the terminally ill. Uh, Tanya, you were making the point about the impact on disabled uh, people. Mm. Um, but there are others who are not disabled before they know that they're going to die sooner than they'd want to. Why would you deny them the cho this choice that Michael's putting forward? because I'm, I'm not convinced by the safeguards uh, and in terms of uh, doctor's ability to make uh, a judgment on that settled wish. So the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, you know, hasn't been fully implemented. You know, doctors are saying that there are challenges with making that assessment. So it's, it's how much time, and this is where you get into the detail very quickly, how much time do you spend deciding whether someone has a settled wish? And in Canada, uh, you know, 232 people changed their mind after asking for assisted dying, then changed their mind. 22% of those right up and, you know, at the point where they were meant to take these lethal drugs. So the settled wish thing is not something, in, in some cases, that is permanent. You, you see the cases and they are heartbreaking. They are absolutely heartbreaking. And I've watched family members die in not grew up, you know, really not ways that you would want them to or ways that, you know, you, you kind of hope. But that's probably made me even more determined that, that actually the safeguards and the ability to make some of these judgments aren't there. Not, you know, it's, it's going to be really difficult to, to actually have this in a, a safe way. To be, to be clear, what we're talking about when we're talking about assisted dying is uh, medical practitioners uh, being given the power to 
uh, prescribe um, lethal drugs which the individual will take themselves. We're not talking about anybody else being involved in the final, in this final act. So, Michael, what, how do you respond to what Tanish just said? Well, I respond by saying um, there's a lot of suffering, as we've just heard, uh, but also people make the choice. Uh, and we have large numbers of people who uh, are facing a terminal illness committing suicide. I mean, there are cases... I mean, one man who lay down on a railway line in front of a train to be decapitated, mm -hmm. people shooting themselves with shotguns, uh, horrible things. And it, to argue that um, we must deny people the choice in the face of that... And, you know, Tani, at the end of the day, we're in the House of Lords, we're not elected. But we do live in a democracy, mm -hmm. and consistently polls show that more than 80% of the population want Parliament to change the law, to give people the kind of choice um, that, that, that many people wish. They may not exercise that choice, of course. Yeah. Uh, and we have a fantastic hospice movement in this country which provides palliative care, but there are limits to palliative care and there are some forms of illness which you just cannot take away the pain or, you know, motor neuron disease where bit by bit you've... And until eventually you're unable to breathe. And why should we deny people that opportunity? And then on the other side, you have things like the Liverpool pathway, where we allow people to starve themselves to death. Mm -hmm. A horrible way to end their lives. So why not be more compassionate? Well, the, the question I think that is asked is, you know, do you want a good death? No one would vote to have a horrible death, but you know, palliative care is still a postcode lottery in this country. So Baroness Finlay's amendment in the health bill, you know, has, has moved that on quite Very considerably. Yeah. And, and that's really good. But if you don't have the right support, you don't have the right palliative care, you're not able to have that conversation. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's final. There is no going back but from it. But it's not either or. You can have good palliative care and still leave people with a choice. I mean, I support it. I mean, I've raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for people involved in palliative care. So in the countries yeah. where assisted suicide exists, and you look at the Benelux countries, actually palliative care has gone downhill and there's less palliative care and less support. It's, uh, the suicide rate hasn't dropped. It's, it's gone up in a lot of cases. The devil is always in the detail yes. of this, is that uh, changing the law just doesn't solve all the problems. And, and what we, we know from this country is that the way you're told of a terminal diagnosis is really important. Because if you're told in a bad way, actually, at that point, people would request the option of, at some point, being able to end their lives. But that, that's such a moment in time. And we actually need to spend more time with people and getting the right support around them, rather than saying, OK, this is it, but, your life's over. Right. OK, we, we, we've, we've looked at both of your cases in a little bit, I won't say in massive detail, but in a little bit more detail. Let's, let's see if we can actually find uh, some common ground or at least a common understanding. Now, both of you talked a bit about safeguard. Mm. Uh, Tanya, can you imagine a, a world in which there were safeguards that would satisfy you that it was OK to have this kind of le legislation? I really struggle, to be honest, and that is not what you want to hear, um, because it's how long do you spend assessing somebody to make sure they have a settled wish? How much do you investigate the family around them? You know, the number of people who said to me, where there's a will, there's a relative. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> and you... The, the cost of doing that and the time it takes makes it quite potentially quite burdensome. And that is not to kick the can down the road. But I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that there are enough safeguards that would, would make it OK for the people who feel they're a burden we push down that road. Michael, give it a go. What, what, what sort of safeguards do you, would you imagine would follow, uh, follow a, legislation, a piece of legislation that um, permitted assisted dying I think that might conceivably satisfy Tanya? I think the um, support of two doctors, which covers the, the shipment point which uh, Tanya made, uh, and also some proper counselling. Um, and I, I don't think this would be something to be necessarily rushed into. Um, but, you know, all I'm arguing is, please let the government provide time so these issues can be properly debated and so uh, the concerns which Tani and others are expressing can be enshrined in legislation, because at the moment there are no safeguards. At the moment, 
uh, people can kill themselves, or they, if they're very wealthy, they can go to Switzerland, a horrible thing, without their, without their relatives and family because they run the risk of prosecution. The courts are crying out for Parliament to act, and it's Parliament's duty to do so. We can't just leave it to the judges, and we certainly can't leave it to the prosecutors to decide whether or not um, to bring a criminal charge uh, in cases where, where people have died. I mean, one, sorry, to, uh, one, one thing I don't think we talk enough about is death in this country. And, you know, I'm... I'm well, we've had a lot of it recently. It. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I don't come from any religious point of view. I think when you die, you die. That's, that's it. There's, there's nothing else. So I think we have to talk about uh, death in a different way and we've got to have uh, some, some better understanding around it. But if we change a lot, we also have to talk about what drugs would what lethal drugs would be used and how they'd be used and what cocktails. And th well, I think people need to know some of these things. Well, we can't that... do that if we don't have the legislation and if folk like you are preventing Parliament from deciding it. I'm, I'm not preventing Parliament. I'm not stopping any MPs debating this or, I, I or what, the government but you know, debating I, I, it. I, I, think very what, well. I, I think what Michael is saying, that there have been procedural devices, that amendments have been loaded into the bills in the House of Lords mm. that stop. And that court. essentially means that things run out of time. We, we could get into the procedural question, but I, I'm, I'm still keen to try to see if there might be a place in which there's something worth talking about. The government's general view at the moment is this is a matter for parliamentarians as individuals. Parties shouldn't get involved and so on. And that's why there isn't any uh, government will behind it. Well, actually, the real reason is no government minister wants to get into this because who needs it? But it clearly is an issue. Um, it is clearly something that people, broadly speaking, think they know about. Three quarters of the public supported change. And we're seeing the changes in Scotland, potentially, possibly the Isle of Man. Mm. Uh, Tony, what, uh, you, you say you would resist, the, or you can't see it, but can you envisage a situation where essentially the neighbours, mm. Scotland and Isle of Man, mm. have permissive legislation and people are basically getting on the ferry or going to Gretna Green? Is that, that's not a great situation, is it? No, it's not. And then those jurisdictions have to decide whether they want almost tourist-assisted dying. So whether they... If legislation is passed in places like Jersey, uh, which they're looking at at the moment, whether they want it for, a, you know, Jersey resident or how they, they would get around it. So, um, no, that's, that's not ideal anyway. I don't think that's how Jersey would like to be thought of as the place to go. But there's a danger here that we end up with the worst of all worlds, which is, as he's saying, there's no safeguards here, there's no safeguards for people who go to another jurisdiction, and we have a sort of to be wild west frontier to, of death. To be fair to the um, Scottish position, I think they would require one year of residency. I think that's, that's as what we proposed, so there would okay. be no option. I, I don't know about the situation in the Isle of Man, um, but it's certainly Well, they're not, still not considering the it. Of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's rather similar to the situation of people going to Switzerland. I mean, I think the most significant thing is, until recently, the BMA and most of the Royal Colleges had been opposed to this. Now they're neutral. I think there's a realisation um, that, you know, change has to come. And if you, th if you think about the legislation, difficult things which are um, matters of conscience, like abortion, like the abolition of capital punishment, like the legalisation of homosexuality, all of these matters were private members' bills where the government provided time and support and Parliament was able to consider them properly. And I don't think anyone would want to reverse that legislation and all of them suffered from the same problem, which is that private members' bills find it very difficult without government time. So why not have this discussion amongst elected people and let Parliament decide? So the BMA going neutral is a, an interesting change. A lot of the doctors who voted in that are no longer practising. If you ask palliative care doctors, uh, they they don't want this. Uh, and there is a movement which says, OK, keep persisted dying out of healthcare, but then that comes back to my original point of who and when and how. And, you know, people, I think, assume it's going to be this Hollywood death. And that's how I hope my death is, And you know. But, but actually, again, from all the jurisdictions and, and even, you know, the Canadian Association, which is uh, the maid assessors, so that, you know, that's the group that is, is overseeing it, um, are 
are saying that, you know, it is not Hollywood death. There's nausea, there's vomiting, you have to take 100 pills. It's horrible stuff to take. And, and that's, that's the right... We do need to have that kind of detailed conversation. It's not an injection, it's not euthanasia. You know, the reality is so far from a Hollywood death for, for many people. I don't, I don't know what you mean by a Hollywood death, but... Well, you slip away. The, the, the soft know, focus, and, and, it's, and yeah. it's nice, and it's lovely with everybody oh, around but, you. Yeah. But, but uh, there's no uh, Hollywood death in those people who take their own lives, because there's no alternative. We're, we're coming to the last few minutes, and I, I just want to put to both of you that um, somehow there needs to be a resolution of this, because I think everybody would agree that where we are now is not satisfactory, that there needs to be some way of resolving this question. So, you know, I think they're involved in 13 attempts at the House of Lords to pass legislation, and it keeps coming back, and uh, we have these very painful debates. All three of us, I think, have experienced um, painful deaths of people close to us. How can we resolve this? Is there a way of debating it? Is it a royal commission? Is it simply saying that somehow Parliament has a time limit to, to decide it? Do we think about, horror of horrors, a referendum? How would you, how would you, how would you resolve the question, Tani? Uh, I'm not sure a referendum is, is Can potentially... Can you that? Yeah, OK, I'm good. <laughs> um, because, it's, again, you know, it's, do you want a good death or a bad death? That's quite a binary question. Uh, pr probably, you know, the, the comments... We, we're not there to run the country, the House of Lords. We're only there to say to the government of the day, have another think. So, potentially, you know, um, you know the government has to give it time. We're in agreement. Um, I think the government... I, I, I don't think this is something you can leave to private members. I think the government has to help a private member to draft a bill. I think many of the points which Tani has made do need careful consideration, uh, and you need to have a, a debate, and the government has got to make time. Whether the government are prepared to do that two, two, two years away from a general election, I don't know. But what I would like to see is the parties who are likely to be in government giving a commitment in their manifesto that they will allow time for these matters to be properly debated and considered in the same way as we did with other matters of conscience in the past. Would you agree with that? Uh, I agree that I don't think any government's going to do it right now, and uh, I'm not sure many MPs are very keen on the idea of it. Well, in, in, it's which not case, vote winner. in which case they'll debate it and it, it won't go through, but mm. it's not satisfactory that we're in this kind of okay. no-man's land situation. We are, unfortunately. Out of time, I think we've actually, to my slight surprise, got somewhere. I think you both agree that the current situation isn't satisfactory. You, Tani, would not want to go where Michael wants to go. I think that you, Michael, do recognise that Tani's points about safeguards are mm. extremely important. Uh, what you also agree, actually, is that uh, the people who should really be taking the lead here seem to have gone missing at the present time. And um, I think, if anything comes out of this, that you've both thrown out a challenge to uh, our members of Parliament, um, particularly... Members of the House of Commons. Members of the House of Commons, I beg your pardon, <laughs> to get on with it, to gird their loins, have some courage and deal with this incredibly difficult question. And I appreciate both of you and the way you've dealt with it. Uh, thank you to both of my guests. Uh, that's it from us. Stay with us. We'll have all of today's news coming up after the break.